Kesuma Kenya, Dubatantu, Isinife Ipsenjada. The next guest speaker is, her name is Zakia Posey, is a PhD candidate in anthropology at Michigan State University with a research interest in transitionalism, discourse, and identity. Had dissertation examined three roles of Oromo institution in Washington, D.C. metro area, playing and forming Oromo identity, formation, practice, and Oromo nationalism. From 2009 to 2010, she served as the secretary of Oromo Study Association. In addition to her academic pursuit, she has an interest in art and has produced the cover of artwork for the online magazine Ogina, Oromo Artists in Diaspora. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Candidate Zakia. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm going to give this presentation in English. <laughs> so. Um, my presentation is entitled, uh, The Bali Rebellion, Wako Gutu, and the Importance of Memory. Um, I would like to talk to you today, um, not simply as a student or a scholar, but as a daughter of the diaspora, seeking to share what she has learned about the Bali Rebellion through um, one of its participants, uh, Obo Hangasu uh, Wako Lugo. My presentation is about the characters and the context of the Bali Rebellion, and the importance of memory for oppressed groups like the Oromo. This paper grew out of a Q&A session at this year's uh, Oromo Studies Association conference. As an audience member, an audience member asked um, a panel that I was on what we felt should be done to revive Oromo history. I did not have a satisfactory answer to his question. Instead, I simply expressed my frustration uh, at trying to make sense of key events in Oromo history. I stated that we needed a better understanding of the past to simply get the elements of the story straight first before we could fully move forward um, and to use its lessons. Uh, there's a need to uncover and interrogate the past more than we have so far. Uh, for the Oromo today, this can be a difficult task because major events in Oromo history lack detailed accounts beyond simple timelines. There are two major, major reasons for this scarcity of detailed information. Um, about um, Oromo's role in uh, history over the last 50 years. Uh, so the first one is uh, the Oromo, since their incorporation, have lived under repressive regimes where simply speaking about one's past was and still is a perilous affair. As a result, Oromo voices have been rendered silent um, about key moments of, uh, during the modern period. Second, Oro second, the Oromo, for much of their history, have been an oral society, and instead of the past being located within historical monographs, it is contained within its people. So Oromo history is a living history. In the past, traditional oral historians ensured that the past was remembered via their accounts of what occurred during each goddess cycle. Further, family elders were also repositories of information. Today, however, these institutions have disappeared or eroded, and the only thing that we have left are um, the participants who participated in the recent past. We need to capture the voices of our elders before the information is lost and the stories untold. Thank you. At this stage, I would like to give you a brief summary of the rebellion. I know some people have done this already, but I'll just try to be brief. Um, the Ballet Peasant Rebellion took place from 1963 to 1970. This rebellion was the first time in modern Ethiopian history that the Oromo were able to conduct a protracted and highly coordinated um, rebellion against the state. The uprising was due to grievances stemming from the lack of political and administrative power, land alienation, taxation, ethnic hostility, religious discrimination, and ecological imbalance. Its primary goals, um, its primary goals were the re repossession of land and the reassertion of uh, ethnocultural identities. Uh, the people of Bali always viewed conquest as illegitimate. The, revol the revolt was a multi-ethnic collaboration between the Oromo and the Somali. Though the groups were distantly related, they were also distinct. The two were unified in their religious orientation and their experience of exploitation. However, they did differ. 
The, Som the Somali component wanted to reconnect Bale with the newly independent Somalia. The Oromo, on the other hand, wanted independence from both Ethiopia and Somalia. The rebels were able to effectively control much of the Bali province. Uh, it was only with the help of foreign military assistance, the withdrawal of support from Somalia, and the regime's change in its strategy with the rebels that brought about the end of the uprising. After the end of the insurrection, resist resistance still continued, but in a clandestine fashion. In order to fully understand why the rebellion occurred in the first place, I asked Obo Hangasu what life was like for the Oromo prior to the rebellion, and his answer was not what I anticipated. Um, I thought that he would just talk about what immediately preceded the rebellion, but instead he um, gave me a kind of genealogy of conflict in the region. Okay, so the following comments will be based on an interview I did with Obo Hangasu. There were two different kinds of experiences the Oromo people had before the rebellion. Prior to conquest, the Oromo had their own way of life. First, they had their democratic goddess system, which regulated all aspects of a normal society. It had laws to protect the life of humans, the environment, and plants and animals. It had laws that ruled how people should live together, how they should marry, how they should transfer power. The second way of life occurred when the oppressor came. They replaced our laws with those that did not care for humans or their animals. They brought about the selling and killing of people at will. Further, the things that the Oromo produced could be taken away at any time. It is this second way of life that gave birth to the rebellion. By, way, by the end of the 19th century, the Oromo's lands were occupied, though this was the case, resistance continued. For instance, one example occurred in the 1930s when the Italians occupied Ethiopia. During this period, the people of the region had a break from oppression for five years. They experienced a different kind of life where they could actually live. They were able to think and get their hands on weapons and to pre prevent the Habashas from totally controlling their lives. When the British came back to drag out the Italians and to bring back the old regime, the people were ready to fight back this time. According to Obohangasu, um, the thought of the return of the old regime prompted a violent reaction from the Oromos and, and, and Bale. An example, occurred, example of this occurred when the Italians left um, and Haile Selassie was brought back. There was a battle between the Oromo and the Imperial forces. At this battle, the Oromo defeated Selassie's army and there were many casualties from the Selassie side. As a result, the name of this place was changed from Welmel or Malka Karsa to Malka Amara, the river of the Amharas, because it was the place where they were defeated. Mohammed Gada Kallo, Dere Eresa, Chiri Jara, Jara Habisu, Haji Guya Dibe, Horo Galmo, Yambe Shonko, Buta Kumbi, Eresa, Kombe, Toreburu, Abdi Gudal, Tare Gudal, Jaldal Mina, Buta Bada, Haro Bariso, Gobana Dayu, Robagada, Jilo Barisa, Aga Teso, Haji Jara, Brakitu, and many more helped to organize the people to fight um, sometime in the, at the end of the 1930s. So after the battle, the enemy came back with a stronger force, dividing the people and buying the people off. They took 130 leaders to a place called Goba. They took them to the Ganale prison in Goba where they were assassinated. Uh, there, uh, there were some people like Chiri Jara, who was not captured, but his property was confiscated. Eleven years after this battle, the nephew of, of Muhammad Gado Kallo um, organized the people again in Anole, which is located in a place called Hangetu. He organized the people to fight the Habasha army, and the battle went on for two weeks. The military was sent in from all directions and cut the people off, and everyone there uh, perished. You may wonder what all this has to do with Bale, but Obo Hangasu mentioned these events because he illustrated, he wanted to illustrate that Bale was not simply a one-time reaction um, or the brainchild of Somali irredentism of the 1960s. He wanted to show that it was not just agitated from outsiders as it was characterized by the Selassie regime. The Bale rebellion had its roots in the local history of resistance. Uh, uh, further, according to Obo Hangasu, uh, Muhammad, Gada, Muhammad Gada Kello and General Wakogutu were cousins. 
There was a familial link between the past unrest in the region and what occurred during the Bali Rebellion. General Wako Gutu grew up hearing the stories and grievances his people experienced due to their interactions with the Abyssinians. Let us move on to, this, to discuss the rebellion's key figure, General Wako Gutu. So prior to um, speaking to Obohangasu, I really didn't know too much about uh, General Wako Gutu, so the comments that I have below are based on our conversation. As a young man, uh, General Wako Gutu was known to be very generous. He was what I was told was called Bashasha. He was empathetic in his youth. He tried to, ser to be of service to those in his community. When the elders asked the youth for assistance, he was frequently the first to volunteer. Another trait that he possessed was the ability to forgive. If he had a conflict with you and it was resolved, he did not hold a grudge. And sometimes there were extreme conflicts and he was able to get over it and be forgiving. Further, he had an early inclination to fight, especially against injustice. As a young man, when he was 14 years old, he got a gun without his family knowing. In those days, there was a weekly market. The police in charge of maintaining order were instead often causing disorder. If they desired goods like honey or butter or goats, they, they could buy them at any price that they saw fit or simply take the items and beat the sellers if they resisted. Uh, they were the rule. Uh, and they could do what they felt, uh, and no one could stop them. However, when General Wako Gutu saw the police taking advantage of the old, or an aroma that he knew, he would beat them. Knowing the government, no, uh, so after a while, um, oh, so he would beat them. Um, his father, Gutu Usa, Usu, was uh, a known man, a kalu, and the people had a great deal of respect for him. So though General Wako was not from a poor family, he felt the need to help those less fortunate and also the vulnerable. Because of his actions, in a short time, he became known to the government, the police, and his community. He, he um, obtained a reputation for standing up for his people. When he reached the age of 30, he was elected chief. As a chief, he had to mediate between the government and its people, and, and the people. Though, though this was the case, he often challenged the dictates of his superiors. For instance, when they asked him to bring someone to prison, he would ask what the, what the person had done, and if he felt the person was innocent, he would not follow orders. He would also bail people out and act as a wasp of the jail. He was warned about his behavior, and after a year, they took away the title because he was not being compliant. All the while, the situation um, associated with land alienation among the Aroma was worsening. The Habasha people began to tell the people to leave the land. General Wako Gutu started buying guns to protect the people. This was done all across uh, Aromo land. Um, the last thing that pushed the people over the edge occurred in Liban and Barana. The Aromo that lived in this place were asked to leave the country and they started to take away their property and some were being killed. As a result, the people, people gathered to figure out what they should do. They decided to go to the government to plead their case and, inform the, and to inform the government they they intended to stay on their lands. They were ignored, and the forced dislocations continued. Among the people that were killed was the son of Abdullah Gutu's son, who was Wako Gutu's nephew, the son of Abdi Gudal, and the son of Isak Sude Gobana. Senior, senior elders and leaders consulted, and after a long meeting and debate, they decided to defend themselves and fight back. They asked the people living in the affected Barana and Liban areas to move to Bale so they would be protected. Um, on his part, Wako, General Wako Gutu organized a group of 40 men and left for Somalia to gain support. They told the government that the Ethiopian government was killing their people and taking their property. They were told they should not go back to Ethiopia because due to their small numbers, their odds of success were small. They were offered cars and places to live in Somalia, and some of them stayed. General Wako Gutu, on the other hand, dismissed the idea and, and stated that though they fought, fought against a large enemy, he was confident in his people and that God would help him in his struggle. General Wako Gutu was a very decisive person, um, and he just told them, okay, just sell me guns, and I'll go back to my people. He was a man of very few words, but people followed him not because of his rhetoric, but because of his actions. Um, and so 
you know, there's, and so I have a little more here. By the time he returned, there were land confiscations occurring throughout the region at a rapid pace. And there was a family whose property was being taken in Melka'ana, uh, the Melka'ana section of the Ganali River. When General Waku and his group heard that the Habasha took another person's property, they got into a fight with them. And General Waku sent 25 people to this place to protect the people. The 25 people took 19 guns from the army and killed 27 of them. Two people died from the Oromo side, um, uh, Ahmed Ma Mahmad Balade and Nur Isak Dado. This is how um, some of the fighting began in Abale. Um, next, I asked Obuhangasu how the movement went from being local, a localized movement to spreading to the entire region. Um, and, and this is what he said. So many Oromos were being evicted all around the region, and this was a pressing concern affecting many people. When the news spread that the Oromos had successfully organized themselves to protect their lives and property, the people in other areas were inspired. They began to think, if the people around Lieben Barana and Bali did it, why don't we try? This began to be replicated again and again all around the region. People started to think that change was possible. People were always resisting in Bali because they never fully accepted conquests. Um, so um, what made this area strong was the culture at the time. Their ethos was such that they believed it was better to perish than to accept oppression in their own land. Bravery was admired within traditional Oromo society, and this was an influential force. Many aspects of traditional culture s survived in Medawalabu. Um, it was not diluted. As a result, they were able to use these elements to their advantage in their fight against oppression. Historically, the Oromos um, had connections to other Oromos all around the region and could call on one another for help through traditional relationships. And these relationships could not be easily infiltrated by outsiders. This is what helped the people of the Bali Rebellion. So culture was significant. In the conversation that I had with Obuhangasu, I was only able to scratch the surface of the rebellion and after nearly a few hours of conversation, you know, uh, you know, I realized that it would take much more to even get to the heart of the story. Um, there's so much work to be done about the rebellion and other key elements in Oromo history. Um, so through a conversation about the past, I, a member of the diaspora, was able to gain some insights into the root causes of the uprising and its leader. This 50th anniversary jubilee is a monumental occasion because this is an act of um, commemoration and heritage building. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about memories, right? So memories of the oppressed are often viewed by the dominant group as being heavy burdens. They have the potential to be triggers of unrest. They have the potential to be pathological and obsessive. So dominant groups typically view memories in a negative way, especially if they're held by the oppressed. While it is true that the weight of certain kinds of memories like trauma can be debilitating and inhibit action and growth. This can't be said of memories more generally. Memory has other functions as well. Let's talk a little bit about this burden of memory. Um, is heaviness truly terrible and lightness splendid? So is being free of memory a splendid thing? And is being you know, burdened a bit by memory such a terrible thing. Um, those in power often provide a remedy for excess memory of its minorities. And they suggest that you guys participate in amnesia. So amnesia is often seen as the corrective to um, memory. But I want to just say something briefly. Amnesia is also connected to amnesty. So amnesty and amnesia are related. Let's go back to the burden of memory. When you exercise and you lift weights, so many of you, got, all of you are, well, two-thirds of you are men. So when you exercise and you lift weights, you have to carry a burden, right, to increase your strength and to increase your muscles, right? So with burden, there's also growth. Fatigue spawns growth. So memories, they may be at times a burden, but through your working through them, you can um, get to another level and grow. Today is a figurative exercise and the transforma transformative aspects of memory. Some of the memories shared here today about the Bali Rebellion are collective beliefs 
that play a fundamental role in securing a sense of togetherness and cultural solidarity, which is vital in the formation and legitimation of any national identity. Commemoration is a way of claiming that the past has something to offer the present, be it a warning or a model. So I'll say this again. Commemoration, commemoration ceremonies like these are a way of claiming that the past has something to offer the present. Memory then mediates between the past and the present, and we can only bring the, bring the past to the present by remembering it. Culture is a kind of memory, and if you get, forget about your past, you will also forget about your culture. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about today is this notion of jubilee. This is a jubilee celebration, so I wanted to talk about what jubilee actually means. Um, jubilee is connected to memory. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, this, the Jubilee year was a year of emancipation and restoration, which according to um, the Old Testament, Leviticus 25, it was to be kept every 50 years, and it was to be proclaimed by the blasts of horns. During it, fields were left uncultivated, slaves were set free, and the lands and houses that had been sold were, would revert to their former owners and heirs. The word jubilee is connected to a Hebrew word which means yobel, which means ram. But it actually refers to the ram's horn, which was used as a trumpet to proclaim the jubilee year. When the term found its way into our language via Latin, it came to be associated with a loud cry or a shout and at times celebration. One would and should indeed celebrate the restoration of freedom and one's lands. The YBL root um, is connected to, so the word yobel is connected to the flowing of wealth, water, and sound. It could also mean to rain hard. Jubilee is about flow, and ballet was about a release from a certain kind of bondage. Ballet helped to water other movements in and outside of Ethiopia, and even after it ended, its memory set a precedent showing that the Oromo could successive, successfully resist opposition um, in a protract, protracted fashion. So 50 years later, the memory of ballet, the ballet rebellion is still flowing, crying, and trumpeting for us to listen today. We should listen to what the memories here have to teach us. Thank you.